Well, dear colleagues, we've had a delightful start to our symposium with uh, Father Boutet, if I may say so, emphasizing the more personal aspects of the kind of change that is needed, and Jacob emphasizing the more policy aspects of change that are needed. Uh, can I ask both of you to address the question, what one thing can each of us sitting here do which would make a difference? So maybe I would start with you, Father Boutet, if you don't mind. What one thing can we do which would make a difference? Je, I will answer in, in French. Yes, of course. So, <laughs> Euh, je pense que cette prise de conscience, déjà dans les relations personnelles, coming to grips, uh, uh, businessman was supposed to make redundant a thousand persons, uh, um, producing diesel engines. Nobody used diesel engines, and he met up with all the employees, and somebody came up and said. Well, how about saying good morning, everyone, uh, and smiling? There's so much hatred and uh, fighting with one another. Perhaps uh, if we were to say good morning and smile at someone else, then at least we'd try and work together. If I emphasize the personal aspect of the need to change, you also pointed out yourself that you had to work towards this uh, goal. It's not simply a matter of doing things well, but doing what needs to be done, what is necessary, and we need to cooperate with one another. And the need to cooperate, to work along, to open up to the other person, to smile at the other person, well, you have to start by changing from within. And then you can change from without. And we need the necessary skills, the necessary information, because there's no point just having ideas. You have to have the skills to implement these ideas. But it's not enough to have skills if you don't understand that what's at heart of all we do is the human being. My decisions are not going to change a set of statistics, but are going to change. Thank you. Jakob. Well, it's, it's a very difficult question on, on one level because, of course, personal situations are very different. You know, you live in, in, in different countries and different environments, and I'm sure you've really thought about, you know, things you could do. I mean, I think the important thing is otherwise, you know, there are organizations to, to join, but the point is most people know what they can do. I think what we need to be aware of is that um, uh, the media always like to be, you know, cynical and sort of pretend that it doesn't really matter. Well, I mean, everything matters because, as I said, we are a uh, much above average part of the problem. Uh, rather humorously, there was once a study in Germany which worked out that if a German couple splits up and creates two single households, the extra resource consumption is as much as that of total consumption of 31 Namibians. So, uh, you know, there's a lot we can do and it all, uh, it all matters. But I do think it's also important that we get engaged in public and political life, not be becoming, you know, lifelong politicians, but uh, going in and out, working through political parties, realizing that this is where the framework decisions are set. And one reason why we are so frustrated and always complain that, you know, well, individual actions don't, uh, don't seem to have enough impact is that we haven't put enough energy into also making sure that the, the right policy incentives are there and that the, the wrong policy incentives are blocked. And the other side, of course, who's pro profiting at the expense of the future and, and, and the environment uh, know this very well. And they spend a lot of time on, on, on lobbying and, and making sure that the wrong policies are still in place. Now, unless we counter that and get together to counter that. We are not going to succeed in time. Thank you. Well, this is a time for questions and answers, not just from me to our two distinguished speakers, but from you. But before I invite you to pose your questions, I would like to invite you please to stand up. Can all of you <laughs> please stand up? Then I would like you to find somebody you don't know yet and shake hands and just very quickly introduce yourself and discuss what question you would like to ask? Thank you very much for your sharing. Thank you very much. Nicholas yes. and Jakob, just one second. I will take two or three questions at a time mm -hmm. okay, because we don't that. have that much time left. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Go to that.
Can I invite you to take your seats again? Excellent. Now I am taking questions, so who would like to start us off? Can I have a show of hands? Who would like to start us off? I see one hand, I see two hands, I see three hands. Okay. <laughs> Can I start off with Mr. DeVote, please, Philippe DeVote. Professor. Thank Dr. you. Uh, Father uh, Butte has insisted on the importance of personal responsibility. Uh, this is, of course, essential, and I fully agree with that perspective. But I would like to add something for our reflection. We are living in a world of organization and institutions. And I believe that organization and institutions also have to become collectively responsible. And I would like to propose a definition for our discussions concerning the leader and the values. Uh, Christopher uh, referred to the leader uh, as concerned with values and meaning and sense. And in a seminar in Rome, uh, we discussed that perspective of collective responsibility and the leader was defined as the architect of collective values. And I think it is going a little bit further than the simple individual responsibility. Very good, thank you. And I have Dr. I think Malika at the back. Malika Saravai, please. I come from a country where more than half the people have never had electricity, have never had running water, and have never had what most of us take so completely for granted. When I go and try and talk to them about trying to save water, they laugh at us and say, you have had it so good. We haven't even had water, so why are you bothered about our wasting water when we try and have a bath? And I have not actually been able to find an answer that will convince them. And I would like both our speakers here to help me with this, because I think a lot of the world is in the same state. Thank you. And Paul Jurian, please. Uh, in front, here on the left. Very good, thank you. Thank you. N Nicola, I, well, I, I wish you were so, so right and that a smile in the morning would make the whole day mm -hmm. in any business the, 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 a wonderful, wonderful life. But as, as you know, things very, mo very quickly move in in the company later on in the day. And our reasons for resentment, which have nothing to do with the way we are, the, the, but the way the business is, is organized. I, I'll give you just one, one example, and I'd like you to, to comment upon it. I worked for, for a company where we were meeting every morning, and we had a little session like that, 10 minutes. And the, the motto of that meeting was, uh, remember that the customer is king, that we're working for the customer, and, and so on. And we were exchanging, the idea was to exchange ideas every morning for 10 minutes around this idea. But as soon as we were leaving that meeting, another message was sent to us. The investor in the company is king. It was totally contradictory, it was something else. But that was the whole culture of the business, and it was repeated to us. And as we know, and it was mentioned by Ms. Professor DeVote last year, some famous Nobel Prize uh, in economy said, the aim of the company is to work for the investor. And that means not for the customer and not for the people who are working within the company. This is the environment within which we are. So please tell me, realistically, how much the smile in the morning can have an effect for the rest of the day? Very good, thank you. Three contributions for you two to respond to, please. Who would like to start off? Nicola? <laughs> Alors peut-être, oui, la première chose, c'est vrai, je, je n'ai pas nié du tout l'importance des structures, l'importance d'une cohérence, je parlais, je parlais justement de ce caution spirituel qui permettait aux personnes d'avoir une cohérence dans leur discours et leur agir, 
des valeurs qui transcendent la seule activité économique et, et qui permet à la personne de pouvoir euh, réagir euh, de manière juste et, et dans une ligne de conduite, quelles que soient les circonstances. Et donc ne pas avoir un double discours comme ça. Je pense que ça fait partie complètement de, de cette incohérence du système dans lequel nous sommes, de cette inversion totale des valeurs dont j'ai essayé rapidement d'esquisser un certain ordre tout à l'heure. Mais je pense que si ça ne commence pas par cette relationnalité, il n'y a rien qui va pouvoir se faire par la suite. C'était une première étape, la vérité des relations humaines, la vérité de la rencontre avec l'autre, la vérité... Les relations, la vérité de se mettre ensemble, la vérité de dire aux investisseurs ce qu'il est, de dire aux clients ce qu'il est. Je pense que la vérité doit sortir, afin que nous sortions de ce dark lie de perpétuel progrès. Je veux dire, tout ce que nous expérimentons aujourd'hui est dû à cette philosophie de progrès, c'est que c'est toujours going être mieux. Get better. Uh, Kant, in the 18th century, it's not true. Progress is not never, ne necessarily uh, good um, if there's no soul involved. It's not an element of soul. This ideology of progress is a bit like a doctor uh, at the bedside of a critically ill patient and the patient is terminally ill and uh, he asks how is he doing and the doctor says you're doing fine but tomorrow you'll do even better and that's the way it's going to be until he dies and we need to become aware of the problem and uh, obviously we need skills and infrastructure and I'm coming back to this question raised by Philippe de Root Uh, what strikes me is when we talk about economic and financial crises, every time we think of a special business, a company, we don't have a face behind the business. We've got people in Japan kneeling down and asking for forgiveness on television. We had faces behind names that... Uh, uh, We're behind the disaster in Fukushima. At the time, we saw pictures, faces. We see pictures when there are fantastic profits being made, but when there are disasters, when there are errors, management errors which are being committed with disastrous consequences for mankind, and we no longer see any faces. We see a corporate logo, a company logo. So I think we mustn't leave aside the legal structure of a limited company, but we need to go behind the limited responsibility of a company and see the faces behind it. We need to see the faces who can shoulder their responsibilities and take the flack for all the decisions that they have made, be they good or bad, as to Malika's question. I, I was privileged indeed to travel to her country, and it is a tragedy indeed. You cannot shut our eyes to this disaster. Talked about crisis, subprimes crisis, and the increase of 200 million people who are now below the threshold of the poverty line. Uh, so we're up to 1 billion uh, people who are in dire straits, and there's so much unfairness out there, and people are out for revenge. And I think in a couple of years' time, uh, five years' time perhaps, we shall be ashamed of having ill-treated all our uh, brothers and sisters in the rest of the world. We talk about the common good, and we can't just think locally and see the other as a foreigner, as an alien with whom I've got nothing to be Uh, involved with. Penetrating and eloquent as always, but uh, Jakob? Well, these questions, of course, highlight probably the three most important um, uh, problems and challenges we face. You know, what about the collective responsibility of organizations? Well, we are facing, of course, a collapsing community. Um, when a Harvard professor who is on our council wrote a book recently with a subtitle, How Thinking Like an Economist Destroys Community. And, um, you know, we have done, we don't have a global community, we have a global non-community of atomized individuals, and of course this competitiveness is promoted everywhere, even in the most inappropriate places. We don't have, if you don't have trust, if you don't have um, a community, then of course it's very, very difficult to do anything. I remember discussing um, the, these religion, science and environment symposia, which the Patriarch of Constantinople organized from time to time and there were joint declarations signed by him and the Pope and I said why are they not promoted more in um, 
throughout the churches. And, and you know, one of the participants said, well, maybe they're afraid if they really do promote them and nobody acts on them, you know, it will show up their own, their own powerlessness. I think even communities like, like the church, we have the struggle that we say the right things, but when it comes to action, it's very, very difficult. And I don't see any other solution but the ones which I think, you know, we, we here sort of represent. I mean, you have to work on the personal level, but you also have to work on the, on the political level. I mean, the combination of the two, there is no other shortcut. And as for the second question, of course, this is exactly the challenge we face going to poor countries and explaining to them that, sorry, the, the, the earth is full. And uh, yes, you know, we're responsible, but I mean, nevertheless, there is no, um, there, there is no way we can continue, you know, wasting water. We cannot live for a day without water. We need to introduce a human right to water, to the, but that, of course, would be limited to you know, whatever uh, people's real needs are. There are one of our councillors, uh, Maud Barlow, uh, advises the UN Secretary General on that. The Constitution of Uruguay already has introduced as the first country a right to water. And of course, anything above that, above people's needs, will then have to be rationed and rationed by price. But what is what is the individual right to water? How is that traded? We can see that we're going to end up in an extremely bureaucratic and, and, and complex world. Um, to deal with these shortages in a way which is as, as far as possible. And lastly, regarding you know, uh, companies, and you know, there's, it's true that company legislation at the moment forces the company to prioritize the demands of the investor for, for maximum profits. And uh, this has now been taken up in the United States, which in some ways is really part of the problem. In other ways, on the state level, uh, there is quite a lot of innovative work being done. And there are now a couple of states, Vermont was the first one, where you can register so-called B corporations, and B stands for benefit, where the aim of the corporation is not to maximize profits, but to serve the community. And obviously, it's not a charity. It still aims to break even. But it's, uh, it's exactly, I think, the kind of corporation which uh, I think you would prefer to work for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, we have roughly, thank you, thank you. We have roughly seven minutes left. I would like to finish a little before that. And in order to uh, encourage, as it were, the voice of the people, I would like to have uh, your contributions first and then invite our two speakers just to take a very short time at the end to conclude. So uh, who else would like to raise a point or ask a question? Please, this is your opportunity. Yes, just a moment. Any other hands? Do start and then. If anybody else wants to speak, do raise your hand, even while you're speaking. Thank you. Um, as a professional, but also as a mother. Do, do give your name. Gabriela first. Müller, Mendoza, Switzerland, Mexico. So as a professional, as a parent of two small children, seven and nine, what are the skills, strategies that we can start giving to this new generation for them to already be in a collaborative mind shift and, and be ready for what's coming. Thank you, good question. Um, who else would like to speak? Anybody else? Nobody else? No other questions. We have flattened all questions by these two very powerful presentations. No, I see a hand over there. I'm sorry, I can't see who it is. And Pierre Tsapi, I'll come to you. Yes, of course. Hi, I'm Katrin Ruff from Business School Lausanne. I have a question on education. How do you think education can help this transition um, Great. possible for the future? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and Pierre Tapi, right in front, please, on the, in the front row. Um, you call for this equilibrium between uh, personal consciousness and also collective action. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, democracy today, which are often under the burden on the media pressure, are more adapted or worse adapted? than countries like China or Singapore, whatever, uh, to long-term thinking? Ah, very interesting <laughs> question, uh, or questions so far. Um, no other hands? Then I'll invite our speakers just to take one and a half minutes each, if you don't mind, <laughs> before we conclude the session, please. For education? <laughs> yes. For education, yes, of course. <laughs> The answer. <laughs> oui, la réponse est oui. I think we've emphasized the technical aspect of education and training. We want people that are extremely skilled in technical terms, but there's a terrible deficit when it comes to uh, ideals. So we've tried to improve.
improve things by devoting one hour to ethics in business schools and uh, polytechnics. But I think we've forgotten to educate human beings, the human beings that are capable of understanding reality and uh, understanding what lies what stands behind these structures, i.e. human beings, and they need perhaps um, experience in the field. Uh, they need to encounter poverty, understand that statistics is not, that poverty is not simply statistics in a UN report, but they need to go out well, in the field and experience uh, poverty face to face. I find my, I have the daily challenge there because I have 15-year-old twins, and uh, it, it is a challenge, but uh, you can, if you set a good example, I think the, it does spread. And uh, I just uh, a friend of mine, a professor of um, economics, a lifelong environmentalist, he said they had found that the, the state school nearby where he lives in London was so bad, they ended up uh, using their savings and sending their son to a, a private school. And of course, they were quite worried about how the other children would treat him. And the first day he came home and they said, how did you go? Well, he said, of course, some of the boys said to me, um, uh, you're poor because you don't have a car. And the father said, what did you answer? He said, I said, no, we don't have a car because cars are dirty. And I said, oh, so, you know, green indoctrination obviously succeeded. <laughs> the other question, of course, again, you know, demands an, an, an hour-long uh, discussion. There is a real challenge here, I think. Will China uh, become the model of the future? A, a Korean, um, the, the Korean climate ambassador, Professor Chung, wrote in the Herald Tribune a couple of years ago that the world must be very grateful that China is not a democracy because it means it can take the right steps much quicker in time. And I notice even the New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman writes in his latest book that he wishes the United States could become China for one day so that the necessary changes could be introduced. So that is a really challenging question that we can discuss further. Um, if I may add my own tuppenny worth, um, my view is a rather different one in the sense that I think if we want our children to be representatives of these kinds of values, then we have to train them to be rebels. We have to train them to understand that they're representing a new set of values which is against an established set of values, against a dominant set of values. And there's no point in holding certain values yourself if you're not challenging the other set of values and eventually working with others to topple this other set of values, which is what is leading our world towards doom. On China, I'm afraid I'm not as optimistic as uh, my colleagues here are. I think that China is doing many right things on the surface in terms of public pronouncements, but how much is really being implemented on the ground is very difficult to check. China is not a black box. It is a gold-colored and gold-covered box that actually nobody wants to look into, and even if you're Chinese, probably find it very difficult to look into. So they're making the right kinds of noises, implementation, I remain to be persuaded, is actually happening at anything like the level it should. I would just like to draw your attention to the fact that one third of China's water resources are unfit for agricultural use. As a result of which, in Japan, we have China-free zones where only non-Chinese agricultural produce is sold. That's how bad the situation is in China.